Awakening Hebrew Readers Church, HRC Law Class. I'm your brother, Kasafo. Hope you all are enjoying the day. I'm here with your brother, Zakwa. Shalom, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. We want to continue building and learning the laws to help us in our effort and endeavor to perfect our faith. Today, we will touch on the rest of the law on unlawful images, not to serve or worship them. We learned about the spirits at work in making unlawful images, so it helps understand other laws as well. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 15, please? Cursed be the man that maketh any grave in a molten image, an abomination unto Ahia, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. We want to avoid making graven or molten images. And we want to avoid worshiping them in secret or openly. This was a transgression of Israel before. Can you read Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 9 to 11, please? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 9. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abomination that they do here. And I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. There we see pictures of creatures and whatever idol they worshipped. Today, people have pictures of deities they believe in and creatures around their shrines or just in the house for decorations or memorabilia unawares of the spirits dwelling in them. And there are cultures where they literally still offer incense to the images of men and beasts and other idols. So these are things Elohim it's a wicked abomination to him, so it's for us to stay out of. Can you continue verse 12, please? Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, Ahia seeth us not. Ahia hath forsaken the earth. So, doing these things for Israel is shown our disbelief in Elohim. And disbelief that he could see what we were doing. They had shrines for worshiping and offering incense. Now, having idols or making other Allahams affects our hearts as these other spirits get place in our hearts. So we can understand it's not just a carnal thing being done, it actually affects us within as well. Can you read Barnabas chapter 16, verse 7, please? Mm -hmm. I find then that there is a temple. How then shall it be built in the name of the Lord? Understand ye, before we believe on Elohim, the abode of our hearts was corrupt and weak, a temple truly built by hands, for it was full of idolatry and was a house of demons, because we did whatsoever was contrary to Elohim. Notice that by doing whatsoever is contrary to Elohim, it was the manifestation by our contrariness and our actions that our hearts actually was a house of demons and idolatry. So you can see how it's not just physical things happening. We're not just acting just cause or by something random that actually spirits at work that are leading us to go contrary to Allah and they're dwelling in our hearts. All right. Well, it's important to understand that demons and idolatry in our hearts is shown by our actions being contrary to Allah and his law and his fruits of the spirit. As idols of our heart make us carnal minded and the carnal mind can't be subject to Allah law. Can you read Romans 8 and 7, please? Because the carnal mind is enmity against Allah for it is not subject to the law of Allah neither indeed can be. 
because it's other spirits actually working in that. It's not the spirit of Christ that's subject to the law of Allah Hayim. Allah Hayim has no concord with Belier. So the idols we set up in our hearts, having an idol's perspective before our face, instead of the law, this actually separates us from Allah Hayim. Can you read Ezekiel 14, verse 2 to 6, please? Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 2. And the word of Ahiah came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Ahiah, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, Ahiah, will answer him, that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord Ahiah, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. As you can see here, we saw in Barnabas that idols and demons made us do what was contrary to Allah Hayim. Allah Hayim can see. He's a spirit. He sees things in the spirit. He sees the idols of our hearts and what we're setting before our face. And he's calling us to repent. In order to repent, we have to act to turn from the idols of our hearts and the things that we set before our face. Zachary, if I'm not mistaken, when he's talking about the idols of our heart and the stumbling block of the iniquity before our face, is that our heart's desires and our own perspectives that we've taken on from the idols? Right, because the idol is leading us. Okay. Mm -hmm. One God. Praise Allah for the understanding to know, brothers and sisters, like having our own perspective, our, what we want in our heart, our own desires, that's the idols that we've set up in our heart. And our own outlook on the world, our own outlook on life, instead of looking at things according to our life, which is Ahaya, our Allah and his word that is our life, that's also setting a stumbling block before our face. We, we're setting ourselves up for failure, to stumble at the law, to stumble at the faith and obedience in Yahche Christ. All right. That's why Barnabas 16 and 7 said, because we did what's over with contrary to Allah, I am. because it was the idols that was leading us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's let go of the idols of our hearts, as in, to make it plain for us, let's let go of our own desires and let's let go of our own perspective on things and life and everything, which would be putting away the stumbling block that we've set before our face. Because these are the things that we learn from idols to keep their laws and their perspectives, not to keep the law of Allah and not to walk in the fruits of his spirit through the serving and worshiping of idols. This, when we do this and we take on to this endeavor, we're actually going to keep the law that was commanded us here in Leviticus 19 and 4, please. Turn ye not unto idols. Don't turn our heart from the law to serve the laws and the lust of the devils. And don't turn our perspective from the law to set a stomach block before us through idols. Continue, please. Nor make to yourself molten alahayams. I am a higher alahayam. Molten images include plastic or rubber figures as it's the similar process to metal casting. And hopefully you see, not only are we supposed to keep our heart and our perspective from idols, we're also not supposed to literally make them as well. Okay? So we know we're not supposed to make them. Allah also has other standards for us to uphold in the law to protect us from idols. Can you read Leviticus 26 and 1, please? 
He shall make you no idols, nor graven image. Okay. Don't make the deities of any nation or our own deities, nor any image of Allah Hayyam, because we saw no similitude of him, and he is a spirit to be worshipped in spirit and truth, obeying his law. Continue, please. Nor graven image. Don't carve or graven any image. Okay. Neither rear you up a standing image. Don't set up any pillars for worship. Okay. Neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am a higher Yahweh. No images of stone should be set up to bow down to it. It's forbidden. All right. Those help us for keeping this law. No bowing to stones and no making images of creatures and no setting up pillars for worship. Okay. Uh, can you read Exodus? Chapter 20, verse 23, please. Ye shall not make with me alahiams of silver, neither shall ye make unto you alahiams of gold. That's straightforward. Don't make any deities of those precious metals. Now, even if you didn't make them or graven an image or a molten image or a picture, but someone else did, Remember the law here, nonetheless, to do none of the following. Exodus 20 and 5, please. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. The word bow down means in H7812, to depress, that is, prostrate, especially reflexively in homage to royalty or alahayim. So, no homage to images. The definition also means to bow self down or bow down, crouch, fall down flat, humbly beseech. So that also means literally no bowing down to images and no praying to images. And it, the definition also means to make obeisance or do obeisance, do reverence, make to stoop, worship. So we also do not worship or reverence images. If you find this being done, that's in any religion, that's a key sign to let you know that's not the religion of Allah Hayyam. Okay. Can you read Deuteronomy 11 to 16, please? Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other Allah Hayyams and worship them. You may see. In the world, there are a lot of images that have made, and they've done a lot of work to make them look very enticing. Balahayim wants us to take heed to ourselves so that our heart be not deceived. Don't let those idols enter in our hearts to deceive us, to turn aside and serve them, and think it's okay to make the grave images or have them or to bow down to them or worship them or have a stone to bow down to. Let them not deceive us. Don't let lust entice our hearts through the desires of pleasure or self-indulgence to turn aside from the law to serve others by yielding unto their laws instead of Allahim's. We now know it's against the law of our Allahim to bow down, pay homage, pray to, worship, or reverence images or pillars or images of stone, okay? Can you read Romans 6 and 16, please? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If we yield to the law, we know it's Allah Hayyam we are serving in obedience unto righteousness for our life's sake. Can you read Deuteronomy 8 and 19, please? And it shall be, if thou do at all, forget Ahayah the Alahayim, and walk after other Alahayims, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Bowing down in worship, prayer, honor, or reverence will eventually be the cause of our death, because the worship of idols is the beginning of all evils. Wisdom of Solomon 14 and 27, please. For the worshiping of of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. 
Evil starts with idolatry because the devising of them began spiritual fornication. Wisdom 14 and 12, please. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication, and the invention of them the corruption of life. Idols causing spiritual fornication leads us into lust, which eventually leads us to sin and die, as we read, or you may have read in the book of James. Now, can you read Colossians 3 and 5 and 6, please? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of Elohim cometh on the children of disobedience? Being disobedient are signs of rebellion and stubbornness to submit to the law and are held in the same regard as idolatry. Can you read 1 Samuel 15 and 23, please? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Hopefully by now you understand why these things are the same, because hearkening to and serving idols is the cause in either case. Allahim's wrath comes upon us for disobedience because he holds us accountable for our decisions to serve idols that lead us away from him. Can you read Exodus chapter 20, the rest of chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, please? For I, Ahaya the Allahim, am a jealous Allah, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. We show we hate him by committing iniquity, as it is the service of other spirits to do so. Continue, please. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, love for him, on the other hand, is by fulfilling the law. Can you read First John 5 and 3, please? But this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So, let's love him and joyfully keep his law, not being grieved to do it as it's evil spirits that are grieved by the commandments. If we give in to the devil to be grieved to keep his law, it's a transgression because the commandments must be kept with joyfulness of heart. Can you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 45 to 47, please? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 45. Moreover, all the curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of Ahiah the Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. Deuteronomy 28 and 47. Because thou servest not Ahiah the Elohim with joyfulness, and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. So that's key to understand. We actually have to do it with joy and gladness of heart. And that shows that we love him. Okay. Joy is a fruit of the spirit that we need to increase in and please Elohim. Colossians 1 and 10, please. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim. Our increase in joy in serving Elohim is an increase in his power. Verse 11, please. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So, as the commandments become less grievous, know it's the power of Elohim growing in us, and that power will get us accepted of Elohim in our service unto Christ. Can you read Romans chapter 14, verse 17 and 18, please? For the kingdom of Elohim is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to Elohim and approved of men. And thus, let us strive for acceptance from Elohim, keeping his law, not to worship or serve any image or idols, by rebelling from his law, or being stubborn in not being willing to change from our desires to submit to his law, or by being grieved when we have to keep his commandments because it's not truly our desire to do it with our whole heart. 
All right. Now, the idols of the world. We will see idols and unlawful images in the world. Yet we are guided of what to say in our heart as the world goes after strange spirits. Can you read the letter of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 7, please? Letter of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Now shall ye see in Babylon Elohims of silver and of gold and of wood borne upon shoulders, which cause the nations to fear. Beware, therefore, that ye in no wise be like to strangers, neither be ye and of them. When ye see the multitude before them and behind them, worshipping them, but say in your hearts, O Lord, we must worship thee, for mine angel is with you, and I myself caring for your souls. Amen. Amen. This, this is another sign of an idolatrous religion. If you see images being carried in procession, these are parades or marches and people following behind them or before them, worshiping them, that lets you know this is not the religion of Allah. Hayim, right? Beware not to worship the images seen keeping in mind that it's unlawful to provoke the angel with us, namely Yache Christ, who is leading us to the kingdom. Also, avoid worshiping men in these strange lands as well. We can see Mordecai for an example of remembering Allah and not to worship men either. Can you read Esther chapter 3, verse 2 to 5, please? Mm -hmm. Esther chapter 3, verse 2. And then all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. He didn't do this out of pride or contempt for Haman. As those motives or reasonings are the lust of the flesh. Let's see why he didn't do it. Can you read the additions to Esther chapter 4, verse 8, and then jump to verse 12 to 14, please? Okay. Additions of Esther chapter 4, verse 8. Then Mordecai thought upon all the works of the Lord and made his prayer unto him. Additions of Esther chapter 4, verse 12. Thou knowest all things, and thou knowest, Lord that it was neither in contempt or pride, nor for any desire of glory that I did not bow down to proud Amen. For I could have been content with good will for the salvation of Israel to kiss the soles of his feet. But I did this that I might not prefer the glory of man above the glory of Elohim. Neither will I worship any but thee, O Elohim. Neither will I do it in pride. So he wasn't willing to worship any other but Allah Hayim. And we ought to do the same. And even in our worship of Allah Hayim, we're not to worship Allah Hayim in pride. This is why for the children of Israel, we're not to boast in who we are. Our rejoicing is in Christ Yajay. Our rejoicing is knowing Ahaya, exercises loving kindness, seeing all the grace he's given us to, ch to to learn ourselves and to change and to have the opportunity to investigate and seek after him having this grace period to get things right before the time comes when we're brought under the law right now looking at an example of the second law not to make an image or worship them literally or 
by serving the evil spirits that lead to commit the act. The scriptures show it was not lawful to paint an image or worship it in the days of the apostles as well, to help understand that neither making portraits of people or creatures or worshiping them, even if we didn't make it, is lawful for a believer in the faith of Christ. Can you read the Acts of John 26? We're going to read 26, 27, and 28, please. All right. The Acts of John, chapter 26. There came together, therefore, a gathering of a great multitude on John's account. And as he discoursed to them that were there, Lycomedes, who had a friend who was a skillful painter, went hastily to him and said to him, You see me in a great hurry to come to you. Come quickly to my house and paint the man whom I show you without his knowing it. The believer, he's young in the faith. He's unaware that this is unlawful to do. So it's a sin of ignorance, as has befallen many of us. Continue, please. And the painter, giving someone the necessary implements and colors, said to Lycomedes, Show him to me, and for the rest have no anxiety. And Lycomedes pointed out John to the painter, and brought him near him, and shut him up in a room from which the apostle of Christ could be seen. And Lycomedes was with the blessed man, feasting on the faith and the knowledge of our Elohim and rejoice yet more in the thought that he should possess him in a portrait. Interesting. We're going to see that the man like Comedies, he came from the heathen fashion. And here, the thought of possessing somebody in a portrait. And today, people think like they're holding on to the memory of somebody by having a portrait of them. So you can see these things come from foreign customs. And it's something to learn out of, even as this man had the opportunity to learn, because he was learning of Allah Hayyam, feasting on the faith and knowledge of our Allah Hayyam, yet still learning as he comes from the heathen customs where possessing pictures of those one loves or admires is considered good to do. Um, continue, please. The painter then on the first day made an outline of him and went away. And on the next, he painted him in with his colors and so delivered the portrait to Lycomedes to his great joy. And he took it and set it up in his own bedchamber and hung it with the garlands. See now, he now has a chamber of imagery or a shrine as we would know it. All right. So that later John, when he perceived it, said to him, my beloved child, what is it that thou always doest when thou cometh in from the bath into the bedchamber alone? Do not I pray with thee and the rest of the brethren? Or is there something thou art hiding or is there something thou art hiding from us? And he said this and talked jestingly with him. He went into the bedchamber and saw the portrait of an old man crowned with garlands. And, a, and lamps and altars set before it. He worshipped before the image in his bedroom and made offerings as is still done amongst those unaware of the commandments of Allah. Continue, please. And he called him and said, like Comedies, what meanest thou by this matter of the portrait? Can it be one of thy Allah that is painted here? For I see that thou art still living in heathen fashion. There we understand through the testimonies, it's heathen fashion to paint images of male or female, whether people or creatures, as the law said, don't make any likenesses. And the law said, don't worship or serve them as we see the altar before the image. Continue, please. And Lycomedes answered him, My only Elohim is he who raised me up from death with my wife. But if next to that Allah Hayyam, it be right that the men who have benefited us should be called Allah Hayyam, it is thou, Father, whom I have painted in that portrait, whom I crown in love and reverence as having become my good guide. 
See, see, he didn't know. You see, he believed in Allah Hayyam, yet he was still learning of the faith, and he didn't know if it was right or not to make an image to reverence, but did it out of love and reverence for a man. The evil spirits play in our lack of knowledge of the law and emotions to get us to fall. The apostle helped him understand the faith and his mistake in gentleness. Can you read Acts of John 28, please? And John, who had never at any time seen his own face, said to him, Thou mockest me, child. Am I like that in form, thy Lord? How canest thou persuade me that the portrait is like me? And Lycomedes brought him a mirror. And when he had seen himself in the mirror and looked earnestly at the portrait, he said, As the Lord Yahweh Christ liveth, the portrait is like me, yet not like me, child but like my fleshly image. Jump to chapter 29, please. But this that thou hast now done is childish and imperfect. Thou hast drawn the dead likeness of the dead. And thus, making portraits of people is the fashion of the heathen and considered childish and imperfect to make a dead likeness of the dead because children are unlearned in the words of righteousness, to know not to commit the transgression, as we see Lycomedes still had grown to do in the faith. John teaches how we truly can't make a portrait of a person because we are viewed in the spirits we operate in, in the sight of Allah Hayyam, and it's so we ought to view ourselves. If you haven't seen the lesson on spiritual insight and perspective, please reference it for further edification on this spiritual perspective <laughs> can you read let's go back to chapter 28 and then into 29 to read the rest of what john had said for this painter who have imitated this my face desired to draw me in a portrait he would be at a loss the colors that are now given to thee the boards and the plaster and glue and the position of my shape and the old age and youth and all things that are seen with the eye. But do but do thou become for me a good painter like Homedes. Thou hast colors which he giveth thee through me, who painted all of us for himself, even Yache, who knoweth the shapes and appearances and posters and dispositions and types of our souls, and all the colors wherewith I bid thee, Paint are these, faith and Alahayim, knowledge, Alahayimly fear, friendship, communion, meekness, kindness, brotherly love, purity, simplicity, tranquility, fearlessness, grieflessness, sobriety, and the whole band of colors that painted the likeness of thy soul. And even now raiseth up thy members that were cast down, and leveleth them, that were lifted up, and tendeth thy bruises, and healeth thy wounds, and ordereth thy hair that was dis disarranged, and washeth thy face, and chasteneth thy eyes, and purgeth thy bowels, and emptieth thy be belly, and cutteth off that which is beneath it. And in a word, when the whole company and mingling of such colors is coming together into thy soul, it shall present it to our Lord Yahweh Christ, undaunted, whole, unsmothered, and firm of shape. Look at that. We started off talking about how the demons and idolatry made us do what was contrary to Allah Hayyam. But here, Allah Hayyam is teaching us of the mingling and the company of colors that need to come together into our soul so that when it's presented to Yahweh Christ, it will be a whole soul, firm of shape before him. This is true artistry. True artistry for us all is shown in operating in the fruits of the Spirit, which paints the image of Allah Hayyam to make us acceptable before Christ and also for all the world to see Him in the light of His countenance through the works of Yahche in us. Um, also, for doctrine and understanding, we have to be mindful not to worship creation either. All right. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 through 
17, please. And he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gates of Ahia's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz in H8542 is a Sumerian deity of food and vegetation. So unbelievers, they will create deities for different things as we see here. And we're going to see more. Continue, please. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of Ahia's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of Ahia, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of Ahia, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Being led by idolatry, evil will always increase in the land where it's happening. All right. Continue, please. And have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. And that's a key thing, too, as far as identifying idolatrous religions. If you see violence in the land of this religion, it's letting you know Allah isn't in it, right? Because it's evil spirits leading and doing the things. We also have to avoid the worshiping and serving of Allah creation as they were worshiping the sun. So if you see a religion that's worshiping creation, that lets you know as well that's not the religion of Allah Deuteronomy 14, verse 15, and then verse 19, please. Deuteronomy 4 and 15. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude in the day that a highest spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Verse 19. And least thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, should it be driven to worship them and serve them, which Ahia the Elohim hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the things of creation were created with their own commands to serve Elohim, let's serve the Creator rather than the things He created. All right? Fear, serve, and worship the Creator of them all. Gad the Seer, chapter 9, verse 4 to 7, please. And David said in reply to Hiram, Go and say to my brother, to Hiram, Thus said David, your brother, Be afraid of Ahia, creator of heaven and fire, the sea and the earth, the wet and the dry, the heat and the cold, the mineral, the vegetation, the living and the speaking, the spears, the Pleiades and Orion, the sun and the moon, the substantial and the spiritual, the wandering stars, the senses and everything, all these were created and made without a blemish by Allah Almighty. His name is Ahia. This was important. David was speaking to his brother Hiram. Hiram is a man from one of the nations of the Gentiles. It was important to explain this because in the world, we've been taught to worship different aspects of creation. And David was preaching to help us understand Allah Almighty, Ahaya, created it all. So he is who we are to fear and reverence and worship. To his name, we bow down and worship. Psalms 95, verse 6, 7, and then 1 to 3, please. Psalm 95, verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Ahaya, our maker. For he is our Elohim, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Psalm 95 and 1. O come, let us sing unto Ahia. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For Ahia is a great Allah and a great king above all Elohims. Amen.
Hope this is edifying. We're getting to learn of Ahaya and his law. All the more reason to be joyful and give thanks unto him for what he's teaching us and how to serve him with our whole heart. Anything else, Brother Zakwa? All good. Praise Allah. Amen. Catch y'all on the next one. Shalom. Shalom. HRC, 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 HRC,